Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. Um, uh, hello, everyone. My, my name is Joseph Jun. I'm the director here at the Center for Critical Korean Studies here at UCI. Um, this is the third uh, in our a series of Korean Studies Colloquium, uh, new books and recent books in Korean Studies. Um, this is a, uh, an event that we usually have, a one-day event that we usually have at the end of the, end of the year. We invite um, some of our favorite uh, authors, some, some of our favorite books, uh, and have them do a presentation for us. Uh, obviously, we can't do that in person this year, so we've kind of broken them up into shorter um, uh, uh, presentations. So um, the organizer for this year, she's done a fantastic job, is Higan Kwan. And uh, I'm going to turn things over to her. Uh, but before I do, uh, let me just uh, mention really quickly that there will be time for questions at the end of our session. We're scheduled to go to 1.15 today. And we'll make sure that there's, you know, 15 minutes or so for questions at the end. Um, we please use the Q&A function that's at the bottom of your Zoom bar. Uh, and that's how we'll um, uh, 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 um, do that uh, Q and A session. So, uh, without further ado, Hegyang, uh, take it away. Thank you, Joe. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, today we have two wonderful presenters. I'm very happy to have them in this event. So, the first presenter, uh, Elizabeth Tsung, is associate professor in the Department of Theater at Northwestern University. Her research focuses on the interplay between histories of gender-based violence and transnational Asian and Asian American performance-based art and activism. Her essays have appeared in Asian Theater Journal and Theater Survey. Her recent book, Embody the Reckonings, Comfort Women, Performance and Transpacific Redress, received the book award in Humanities, uh, Humanities and Cultural Studies from the Association for Asian American Studies in 2020. She is currently working on her second book project, Possessing History, a monograph on the inter, uh, interrelationship between Korean diasporic women's experiences of uh, social and political violence, place, and performance. As a, as a Professor Son's responder, I'd like to introduce Tara Rotman. She's Assistant Professor in the Department of Drama at UC Irvine. Her research focuses on the circulation of performers and performance forms among Japan, Europe, and the US in the first half of the 20th century. Her articles have appeared in Theater Journal and Theater Research International. She is currently working on her uh, book manuscript, which examines the Japanese uh, modern dancer and choreographer it Ito Michio. Please welcome Professor Son and Rotman. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Can everybody see that? Great. I want to thank Dr. Jo Jun and Dr. Hegyung Gwan and UCI Center for Critical Korean Studies for this invitation and Joon Shin for his assistance in putting everything together. In my brief talk today, I'll share an overview of my book and then talk a little bit about the Wednesday demonstrations and this memorial that you see in this image. Thirteen years ago, when I began my research on activism surrounding the history of Japanese military sexual slavery, I asked elderly Korean survivors of wartime sexual violence why they attended the Wednesday demonstrations. A 28-year-long weekly protest held across from the Japanese embassy in Seoul, South Korea. One woman, Kirwanok Harmony, and Harmony is the Korean word for grandmother, explained that it was for the future. As a living witness, she believed that it was her responsibility to tell the world about her experiences and to fight for justice. The last time I was in Korea, in summer of 2018, I stood alongside over 100 protesters gathered across from the Japanese embassy in Seoul, South Korea to support Korean survivors ongoing claims for redress from the Japanese government. It was a typical July day in Korea, very hot and very humid. I was amazed when I saw Kirwan of Harmony at the center of the demonstration, lifting her fist in protest and shouting for redress. Kirwanok Harmony has been an active participant at the Wednesday demonstrations, and she has traveled the world to give her public testimony. 
Kirunok was a teenager in 1940 when she was deceived into becoming a sex slave for Japanese troops in Northeast China. The Imperial Japanese Army and Navy forced an estimated 200,000 girls and young women into sexually serving its troops in the years leading up to and during World War II. These women came from Japan's colonies and occupied territories in Korea, China, Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, Burma, what is now Myanmar, and the Dutch East Indies, now Indonesia and East Timor. Like Kirwanok, they endured unspeakable violence and anguish during their captivity in what were really just rape camps. These so-called comfort stations could be found throughout Japan's colonies and occupied territories in East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific Islands. In the early 1990s, survivors began coming forward to give public testimony and to demand redress, galvanizing the then, the then nascent social movement for redress. Activists have pursued political and legal redress that has centered on the Japanese government's acknowledgement of Japanese military sexual slavery and official apology and reparations. To this day, the Japanese government continues to deny survivors adequate reparative measures, despite the 2015 agreement between the governments of South Korea and Japan to try to, quote, resolve, end quote, the issue. In response to a long history of state denials and obfuscations and half-hearted apologetic innuendos, a vibrant transnational network of local activists has organized throughout Asia, Europe, and the United States. Alongside the work of activists, artists have been using various cultural forms from poetry and documentary film to visual art to address the history of Japanese military sexual slavery. In the last two and a half decades, there has been a proliferation of stage productions about the experience, experiences of comfort women. Theater provides the space for re-embodying the presence of survivors and transmitting their history through affective productions. The staging of comfort women experiences also uncovers the unspoken elements of activist public events, such as the intimate negotiations of living with trauma. And I'm happy to say more about stage productions that address this history during the Q&A. In my book, I show how the official erasure of wartime sexual crimes in which Japan and the United States participated after the war and Japanese state denials of official redress inadvertently nurtured a transnational movement of activism and artistic intervention. And when I bring in the United States, I'm talking about their complicity in the transnational state silencing of this history. I argue that performance or embodied practice plays a central role in how survivors, activists, and artists have grappled with histories of sexual violence and the erasure of such experiences. The history of Japanese military sexual slavery, a history that centered on the violation of women's bodies, calls for re-presenting, mobilizing, and reinvesting those bodies with meaning through redressive acts such as protests, tribunals, theater, and memorial building. I'll spend the rest of my talk talking briefly about the Wednesday demonstrations and the memorials. The Wednesday demonstrations comprise the longest running protest in Korea and one of the longest running in the world, drawing close connections with the weekly protest of the Madres and Abuelas in Argentina. The Korean Council for Justice and Remembrance for the Issue of Military Sexual Slavery by Japan organizes the weekly rallies, which are sponsored each week by different women's civic, religious, or educational organization. And activities related to the Wednesday demonstrations are not confined to South Korea. As part of what has become a transnational social movement, supporters hold solidarity protests around the world in cities like Osaka, Manila, Taipei, Melbourne, Berlin, Paris, LA, Chicago, and Washington, DC. My interest in the Wednesday demonstrations began as an inquiry into the making of claims for redress through embodied culture, such as the street protest. However, when I started participating in the protest in 2007 and spoke with activist survivors and participants, I realized that something more profound was happening in the streets. The Wednesday demonstrations not only bring to light complicated national, local, and personal investments in remembering and forgetting the comfort women history, the protests are the very site of reckoning or coming to terms with the history and its political and social legacies. In other words, the protests are both a call for redress 
and a form of redress itself with understanding that there could never be full or complete reckoning. Yet there is continual redress, an incessant dressing of and attending to the wound that happens in repeated redressive performances of weekly protest. As fewer survivors were able to participate in the Wednesday demonstrations because of their age and health, the social movement found new ways to maintain their presence during protest. In December 2011, a bronze statue was installed in the space where the protests take place to mark the 1000th Wednesday demonstration. A life-size bronze statue of an adolescent girl in a hanbok, a traditional Korean dress, sits next to an empty bronze chair, which evokes the unnamed who never returned home. In the winter, anonymous people come by to dress the statue in a wool hat with matching scarves, wrap a blanket meticulously around the figure, or dress her feet in carefully knitted shoes. When it rains in the spring and summer, she is sometimes wearing a raincoat. Ordinary citizens take the time to visit the statue and clothe her in order to protect her from the elements. They also bring her gifts such as flowers and stuffed animals. Caring for the statue activates ordinary people to join the redressive community that struggles to keep present the memory of these women. And there are now a number of these statues around the world. Survivors and their supporters who have gathered weekly in Seoul, South Korea, illuminate the ongoing opening up of the landscape of justice so that ordinary people can reckon with histories of violence and enact social restitution through embodied processes in the everyday. They teach us that redress does not solely belong in the hands of the government or courts. It is about changing the way people think, showing respect, restoring dignity, and building a collective memory nurtured by a community that gathers on a rainy day for a protest, listens to testimonies, and works to build memorials. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, for sharing your wonderful work. So, um, Tara, uh, if you're ready. Yes, absolutely. Um, Liz, I want to start by just thanking you for this generous and valuable book. Um, reading it again in preparation for this, I was really struck by how especially now uh, it's sort of central claim that redress is not and cannot be understood as limited to the legal or state sanctioned action, but also needs to be recognized as personal creative acts of survival, art making and community. Um, I think it's very much an idea we need right now. Uh, so thank you. Um, uh, sort of from that um, sort of central claim um, and uh, what you just presented to us from the book, I thought we could start, um, especially because we've got people here from a whole bunch of different disciplines, um, talking about the specific sort of uh, performance-based methodologies you use to work through this material, because uh, there are other really important histories of comfort women, but you take such a beautifully strong uh, position on the importance of performance for our understanding their acts of survival. Um, uh, so I wanted to hear about that as well as your own participation uh, in, in the research um, and in their protests. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you for um, engaging with my work and for these questions. So the methodologies of uh, performance studies are critical to this book, not only in terms of looking at various uh, aesthetic performances as an object of analysis, but also thinking about performance as an analytical lens. And so that helps me to be able to uh, kind of re-examine protests, tribunals, and memorial building with close attention to questions around embodiment, uh, space, and temporality, and audience. And so when I take a performance oriented methodology to bear on, for example, the Wednesday demonstrations, that was when I started to see ways in which the protesters and the survivors were out there not just advocating for redress from the Japanese government, but they themselves were practicing it. 
And that happened, uh, and I immediately noticed that when I was out there, out on the streets with them. And at first, uh, when the protest uh, would begin, the survivors were seated on, um, they were seated on the sidewalk and everybody was kind of facing the Japanese embassy and then people were gathering behind the women. And so it was clear in that kind of physical positioning of our bodies that the embassy as standing in for the Japanese government was our main audience. But as more people gathered, people started kind of spilling out into the streets and then forming kind of a, a circular formation. And now people were turning, they had their backs turned to the Japanese embassy, but they were facing the survivors who are in fact the main audience. So even in that uh, gestural turn of our bodies, you could already see ways in which redress was at work, right? And kind of the duality of protests that are for redress, but also that are a form of redress. Um, this methodology also helped me uh, kind of re-examine the, the kind of ways in which uh, people who participated in the women's tribunal were also kind of um, disrupting legal protocols and speaking back to the limitations of the Tokyo Tribunal that was held at the end of World War II. So at the end of the war, um, after the end of the war, um, I, the Tokyo Tribunal, which was led by um, the US and their allies, focused primarily on crimes against uh, allied POWs, even though there were cases and presentations made around uh, crimes of sexual violence against women. And so when I talk about the US state implication in the transnational silencing of this history, we have to go back right, to the Tokyo Tribunal. Now, now I'm gonna kind of fast forward. What happened in 2000 is that a, a number of different NGOs across Asia, specifically led by Japanese feminists and also Korean feminists and Filipino feminists, decided that they needed to create a people's tribunal to be able to look back and try what had happened as a war crime and to give a space for survivors from different countries to give their public testimony. And so a uh, number of NGOs, human rights scholars, uh, legal uh, professionals, and then over 66 survivors across Asia came together uh, during the Women's Tribunal. And with the performance-oriented lens, I was really attended to ways in which the women were kind of um, pushing against ways in which testimonies oftentimes privilege the verbal articulation of what one had endured. So for example, there was a survivor from East Timor who was trying to recount what had happened to her, but, in, but instead of just recounting verbally, she wanted to stand up and show how she was physically restrained. And so she gets up and tries to move around pushing against the table to kind of embody and show what it was like for her physically when she was being restrained. And that moment where you see her body kind of push against the table, you see her not just speaking, but also um, oftentimes crying or um, uh, certain other movements, gestures where women would show where they were stabbed. These were moments where you could see the women pushing against the traditional legal protocols of testimony and showing us that if we're going to really honor and listen to testimonies by victims of sexual violence, we need to rethink how the court can oftentimes constrain that full articulation. So that's just an example of how a performance oriented methodology really al allowed me to see the kind of duality of performances for redress and as redress, but also to see the ways in which survivors, survivors were pushing against legal, legal protocols. Um, also your question about participation. Um, so I use mixed mix methods. I did archival work in um, various community-based organizations, not only at the Korean Council, which is the main organization at the forefront of the movement in Korea, but also at the Women's Active Museum in Tokyo. But field work was also important to me to kind of embed myself in the, the, the community and life of these organizations, but also to go and participate in things like the Wednesday demonstrations or to go to dedication ceremonies for the, for the memorials. And those experiences, especially meeting the survivors, um, really were profound and I would have to say life-changing. And, I, and I'm 
I have to say that I'm I'm looking back. I'm lucky that I did the research when I did because um, so many of the survivors, right? They are either in incredible poor health, or many of the women that I met during my field work have passed away. And now, you know, I, I talked about the Wednesday demonstrations. When I went in 2007, which is the height of the Wednesday demonstrations, on average, there would be 10 survivors in attendance with 75 to 100 supporters. And in the last, I would say, since about 2011, 2012, because of the health of the women, the number of survivors who have attended have decreased dramatically to the point now where it's rare to see a survivor at the Wednesday demonstrations, but still the supporters, their numbers are, are quite high. Now with COVID, the nature of the protests have changed. So um, at one point you could participate via Facebook Live, um, but so looking back, I'm quite thankful that I had the chance to be able to, to meet the women and to protest alongside with them. And also, I, I had also had the opportunity to be in the audience when some of the survivors came to the United States to give public testimony. Oh. Um, one of the things I've been mulling over is how youth and innocence become these really crucial terms uh, upon which the many, many losses experienced by these women are sort of staked. And uh, from a sort of pragmatic uh, perspective, it makes perfect sense why these are the terms that really get pushed to the forefront. Um, but they're also, you know, like we, we, I think would all agree that if it were a bunch of middle-aged women who had already had sex, who were pulled into sexual slavery, like it would be as much of a tragedy. And so I was wondering um, what, uh, how, whether there was any sort of debate among those terms and, and positions really getting staked out among the Korean council. And then now that there is this younger generation sort of taking it up um, who, you know, uh, as, as much as we are all living in still semi-patriarchal societies uh, have a very different relationship to notions of innocence and so on. Yeah, I think in the, the Korean context, um, for me, it was, it was helpful to, to note um, ways in which ideas around innocence impacted the women's decisions not to come forward. When they when they return because of ways in which in a Confucian influenced society like Korea chastity uh, is valorized and more so um, in the 19 in the 1940s and so for a lot of women because of the sense of shame and social stigma this valorization and what would then follow with the what they had endured led many of them to decide that they would they would not share publicly what they had gone through. And so I think when we're looking at when the women decided to come forward, mm -hmm. uh, and many of them came forward publicly in the early 1990s, it's helpful not only to situate that um, politically in terms of what's happening with, what was happening then with democratic reform and um, relations between Japan and, and Korea and also feminist organizing happening within Korea, but also it's, it's not an accident, right, that the women were already in their 60s, around about their 60s at that point. And so the stakes of coming forward with this were different. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I make an argument that activists were strategic in the early 1990s when they were making this history legible to the public because there was so much misunderstanding publicly. People were not sure, you know, if these women were, were they, were they slaves? Were they sex workers? There's a lot of confusion. And so I make the argument that if we look at the strategies of the Wednesday demonstrations, for example, the images that we saw in banners or the, the rhetoric that was used, there was a lot of emphasis on moral and sexual innocence, that these women were victims, that they were sexually morally pure. And so you saw images of flowers and that and that language is often used, like, why did you take away my bloom of youth? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that was very purposeful in, in using that kind of rhetoric and imagery to make it clear that these women were victims. Now, at the same time, what that then consequently does is 
it then creates this interesting, um, I think, simplification of camp town sex work, mm -hmm. which was also have, which was prevalent on the Korean Peninsula, um, near near you, where the U.S. bases were based in Korea, and so that was kind of also in in people's minds, and in this kind of emphasizing the sexual and more innocence of these survivors, then simplifies what camp town sex workers were enduring. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that was one thing. Um, the other thing is the debate is what's interesting is ways in which um, some people have been critical right of this decision because it creates this dichotomy between the the young innocent victim and now the elderly grandmother right and that kind of trope from innocent to or innocent young girl to now older woman some people say that it erases the sexuality of the women that it um it may simplify or flatten their their subjectivity and whatnot but i think it's just important to recognize that if we look closely at the for example the accoutrements of the protests and we listen and watch then we realize that this was an important um, activist uh, strategy now i think i i'm glad you brought up the word youth because i think if we're talking about innocence we have to then of course talk about youth and if we're talking about youth in relation to this movement it's important to talk about how it's an intergenerational movement. And it's been fascinating to see how it has become so. And to um, just meet different, and you, by youth I'm talking about as young as middle schoolers through college age. And especially after the 2015 agreement between the governments of South Korea and Japan, it was, it was quite remarkable to witness how that had, that had kind of rekindled the movement and university students had really come together organizing, not only to literally try to protect the statue because one of the conditions that the Japanese government stated is that they wanted the removal of this statue across from the Japanese embassy in Seoul. And a number of students for a long time um, created a plan where there was always a group of students there protecting, protecting the statue. But it's interesting when you talk with some of the youth to kind of hear like, why, why, do they, why do they care so much about this issue? And for some of them, you know, it is that they, you know, it's a way for them to honor, right, these, these women. It's a way to remember the history. But for many of them also, they see this as part of a larger fight for women's rights as human rights. That is not simply we want to honor these women, but because we want to honor these women, we recognize that this issue is not simply a nationalistic issue. It is a human rights issue. It is a women's rights issue. And so the presence of the youth, you know, at the Wednesday demonstrations in, in the movement, I think is something that is a testament to the survivors. And it's a testament to the ways in which they've already enacted redress. So one of their demands is education. And that's what they have been doing by going around giving their public testimony, coming out to the Wednesday demonstrations, going and meeting with youth. They have been right shedding light on this history and sharing it and really educating, um, ed educating the next generation. And what I think was so remarkable about this is that we see that these survivors were not just wanting to draw attention to what they had endured and not just fighting for redress for themselves. For them, this is a gender-based violence issue. This is an issue where we have to stop the cycle of impunity for perpetrators of sexual violence. We need to think about what true accountability looks like, right? We need to think about what it means to listen and honor survivors. We need to somehow think about how do we change our cultural norms so that rape being used as a weapon of war is not normalized. I mean, these, these women were just so remarkable, right? In ways in which they were out there fighting for justice, not just for themselves, but for all survivors of gender-based violence. Thank you. Um, I think we have to leave time for questions at the end, although I wanna keep asking you questions, but thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, both of all. Uh, so our next presenter is Yu Jung Oh. She's associate professor in the Department of Asian Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Her articles have appeared in the Journal of uh, Korean Studies and International Journal of Urban Regional Research, uh, 
Her recent book published in 2018, Pop City, Korean Popular Culture and the Selling of Place, examines the use of Korean television dramas and K-pop music to promote the urban and rural places in South Korea. As a responder to Professor Oh's presentation, I'd like to introduce Jina Jun Kim. Jina is a fourth year sociology PhD student at UC Irvine. Her research areas include uh, culture, race and ethnicity, inequality, and economic sociology. Her most recent project examined uh, student experiences in higher education, specifically the relationship between domestic and international students in US college campuses, looking at the ideas uh, of Americanness, membership, and belonging. Uh, please welcome Professor O oh and Gina Kim. All right, thank you. And let me share my screen. <laughs> okay, so um, I thank uh, UC Irvine uh, Center for Korean, uh, Critical Korean Civic Studies and Dr. Hegyang uh, Kwon and Dr. Joseph Jung for inviting me to this fascinating event. Uh, and thank you so much, Ms. Gina Kim for being my discussant. Okay, so uh, my book, Pop City, Korean Popular Culture and the Selling of a Place. And let me start with uh, the recent, recent mega hit drama, Goblin, also known as Guardian, the Lonely and Great God. And I'm going to show you a short video clip, which is the end of the first episode of the drama series. And excuse me, the, this clip contains a huge graphic image in the middle that would hamper your watching, but this was the only one having English subtitles I could find. Okay. <laughs> Okay, the conversation scene was filmed in Quebec in Canada with the sponsorship of Canadian Tourism Office. And you can imagine those filming locations were packaged and sold to global goblin audience after the air airing. And at the end of the clip, you have watched a list of drama production sponsors. And on top of them, there is Incheon Metropolitan City. For American audience, Incheon is a place where uh, U.S. General Douglas MacArthur landed with UN Allied Forces during the Korean War. And the first appearance of the city implies the city provided the biggest amount of sponsorship. Interestingly, the name of the city is also presented in Chinese, obviously targeting the Chinese audience groups who might turn into tourists to Incheon. Okay. And actually the drama production sponsorship by municipalities is a more than a decade old practice in South Korea. Since the early 2000s, more than 60 cities, counties and districts have sponsored the drama production. And more recently with the globalize of K-pop music, Korean municipalities have started to employ K-pop idols in their place marketing. City of Seoul recently hired BTS as its publicity ambassadors three consecutive years since 2017. Then uh, why is so many Korean municipalities draw popular culture in their place marketing? And before the question, why is selling places? The original concept of selling places emerged with the changing conditions of capitalism that is the demise of Fordism and the emergence of flexible accumulation strategies. With the context of deindustrialization, the winning strategy to pin down capital flight 
and rural residents and tourists becomes creating and selling the consumption experiences offered by cities. The central driver of widespread uh, place selling in Korea has been the administrative decentralization. In 1995, South Koreans had their first experience of electing their own local governors and mayors. Against the previous center dominated politics, the newly introduced popular election system has created an environment in which the local state and society envision self-determined futures for their hometowns and energetically design projects for their own interests. All mayors and governors I interviewed remarked their priority is to develop their areas. Despite the political devolution of power, however, local fiscal autonomy remains extremely weak even after decentralization. With immense developmental desires, yet limited political and financial resources, what can local leaders do to develop their areas? Selling place or place marketing emerged in this context as a promising strategy to attract tourists as a means of raising publicity and boosting local economies. Tourist destinations can also be created by giving cities a new image. Television dramas and K-pop music can instantly provide entirely new images to certain places through their stories and characters, regardless of the area's pre-existing identities. Due to the quick and easy creation of pop culture associated places, municipalities that are poorly endowed with material and cultural resources now have new opportunities to promote tourism. Then how does popular culture sell places? Operation of the entertainment industry is based on the ability to manipulate affect within the audience. Affect becomes a source of value by bringing emotions into the relationship between cultural products and viewers, thereby uh, transforming commodities into emotionalized communication tools. The success of the pop culture industry, therefore, uh, relies on the formation of affective relations with consumers. Pop idols and drama characters are human agents used to build an affective intimacy with audiences. The same principle applies to entertainment-based place marketing. The power of commercial entertainment lies in its ability to turn a physical space into an unaffective place. The media presentation of stories, characters, dramatic scenes, performances, and idol images reconstructs a televised space, not merely as a themed place, but as an affective place filled with emotion, imagination, desire, and fantasy. And beside affect, uh, there is another layer. In media studies, audiences are seen as active agents in producing their own meanings and pleasure through the consumption of media content. Unlike other commodities, the consumption of media content does not diminish the value of goods. Rather, the collective aggregation of consumption generates greater value, such as when more viewership lead to greater ratings and the selling of more advertisements. Moreover, the collaborative and discursive consumption of pop culture cultivates additional pleasures and facilitates interactions between people. The amplified pleasures can also be translated into both cultural and material values because the highly engaged audiences pass along the cultural content across diverse media. In urban studies, there have been few efforts to identify consumers as value generators. In conventional placemaking, investors, tourists, and potential residents are seen as passive objects and outsiders to be invited in and encouraged to consume pre-produced urban environments. In pop culture-based placemaking, the audience tourists are active participants as well as consumers in enriching the meanings and values of a place. The audience tourists do not simply appreciate the televised sites, rather they wish to deepen their personal or shared connections with the drama plot 
characters or idols through the places. The bodily haptic and affective consumption of places by the self-motivated tourists amplify, deepen, and sometimes challenge and negotiate the affective values of a place. Such emotional engagement with the place turns visitors into agents of value creation on its behalf, that is, into facilitators of place selling. Thus, the popular cultural mediated, um, I'm sorry. Uh, so as popular cultural products require a certain level of consumer environment, such as longing, royalty, and fandom, the commodification of urban space via popular culture similarly harness audience groups, uh, particularly fans, emotional investments as free but dedicated labor to facilitate its selling. Okay, so let me... Okay. This drama series, My Love from the Star, is about the romantic relations between a top actress, Song Yi, starring Jina Jun in the middle, and this guy uh, in the left, uh, Do Min Jun, uh, the guy from the star having supernatural power. This drama series was extremely popular in China, and this particular scene was sensational. <laughs> Okay, so somebody put Sung in danger uh, and using his supernatural power, right? Do Min Jung figures out her location and materializes and stops the car. This trauma was sponsored by Incheon Metropolitan City, the same uh, city as Goblin sponsor. And after the series mega success, the city placed a red car in the filming site, which was an abandoned stony mountain and attracted audience tourists who, who want to reenact the car stopping scene. The city attracted thousands of group tourists from China, and after their visits, the city government released the promotional materials like those. I, um, we missed the locations of my love, star, right, my love from the star, 6,000 Chinese tourists visited Incheon. Like the heroes of my love from the star, 4,500 yokers enjoyed a chime, chicken, and beer combo, which is another hot uh, item in the drama, my uh, chime party in Incheon. 6,000 Chinese landed, right? This expression is an analogy to refer the uh, MacArthur's landing during the Korean War, right? They landed in Incheon to visit those places right, and enjoy a chime party. This example shows that the municipality's primary promotional asset is the presence of drama tourists itself and their effective consumption of the filmed sites. The effective resonance that commercial entertainment confers on space dramatically advertises cities on the one hand. On the other hand, the actual selling process capitalizes on the audience tourist consumption of the drama locations harnessing their emotional engagement with the place. The utilization of users' emotional engagement in selling places speaks to the severe disinvestment by both public and private marketers of a place. Because dramatizing the urban environment relies on images from TV dramas or of K-pop idols, place-based extravaganzas to very little to improve city's actual physical polities or to resolve community issues. Such as spectacular cultural images projected onto the urban landscape blurs this continuing disinvestment. The process is a sophisticated mechanism in the commodification of urban space. Pop culture fetishes confer dramatized images on urban space and lure effective consumers to engage with and further advertise the place in question. By drawing on consumer agency to both consume and sell place, place marketers can reap returns without significant investment. Such a refined and instant commodification process creates tensions for local residents who are almost invisible in the urban image construction process. 
Popular culture and media create pseudo local histories that do not engage with the community, but simply elicit audience affection that will smooth the marketing and selling of a place. Flamboyant urban spectacles mediated through commercial entertainment have nothing to do with the lived experiences of local residents. Instead, they conceal and distort the existing local reality, local demands, and local politics. Nevertheless, municipalities remain eager to utilize the instant pseudo history created by pop culture to boost their recognition and entice tourists. Place marketers, who are mostly local leaders and civil officials, face a contradictory situation in which the accumulation of a political capital through the sort of instant publicity that popular culture can furnish clashes with their imperative of maintaining legitimacy to enable them to manage the local community. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so this is my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Professor O, for your presentation and for doing the research and sharing it with the public. As someone who immigrated to the States from Korea and grew up watching a lot of Korean dramas and listening to K-pop music, it was really cool to finally read a book where I understood nearly all of the pop culture references. Mm -hmm. um, and more importantly, I learned so much about the social, political, and economic process and context in which Korean culture cultural artifacts are being produced. Um, and it really highlighted the need to critically examine cultural production, placemaking, emotions, consumption, and speculation. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. And I have a couple of questions for you. So you say that um, on page 96, there's a quote, you say, drama producers have little concern about the impact of drama-driven tourism once they have completed their on-location filming, they simply leave. And so when I read this quote, it reminded me a lot about researchers and often ethnographers who also do something similar. They go into a community, extract information, knowledge, and or resources and kind of leave. So I was wondering what you think might be a better alternative practice for drama producers. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, thank you so much for your discussions. Um, and I do appreciate the question. I, um, I never thought about this, uh, but it makes me to ponder whether I was engaging in uh, self-reflexivity uh, in the fields. I, um, so it could be not only drama producers and researchers, uh, but also tourists and Instagrammers, um, those outsiders who visit certain communities for their own sakes, such as making profits, or accumulating material capital, educational capital, and social media popularity, or cultural capital by othering the hosting communities. Um, so they just consume and leave the place and the tangible problems associated with um, such temporary visits uh, should be tackled by residents, right? Such as the disparity between images and realities, right? congestion, littering, over tourism gentrification, and more importantly, marginalization of residents. <laughs> but that does not mean that uh, outsiders visiting should be entirely discouraged, um, since many communities actually rely on uh, flows of people and capital. So then what well, could be a healthy balancing point to offset such negative impacts? I, um, I think the role of the public is all the more important um, to raise awareness and not objectifying and commodifying local places and people's lives. Um, in my case, the opposite, right? The local politicians and civil officials were proactive to package and sell their places right, uh, for outside consumption as a way to boost the local economy. Right? Um, but ironically, the very measures to revive uh, local areas uh, brought more serious problems right, uh, through the distortion of local identity, right, through the erasure of residents' voices, and through over-tourism and gentrification. Right. So I think that alternative approach can include to think communities as a living field 
right, uh, for people, right, uh, not as an object of consumption, right, particularly visual consumption. Okay, uh, yeah, so that's my response, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I really like that, thinking of the community as a living field. Um, and then, so I guess I was wondering if you could also speak a bit about the vulnerability of soft power, which you allude to in your conclusion. What do you think are the implications of this for Korea? Will this Korean pop culture bubble that's kind of formed pop eventually? Uh -huh. I'm asking you to speculate in a way. Yes, yes, right. Uh, so actually we saw um, how pop culture influences can be very vulnerable in front of the real uh, geopolitical and diplomatic issues from the FAD incident, right? Uh, the establishment of the FAD, right? Terminal High Altitude Missile System, right? Uh, by the US on the Korean Peninsula actually provoked China, right? Uh, and China banned imports of Korean entertainment products and then the tourism to Korea in retaliation. Right? Um, so uh, and even without such acute political issues, um, there are fast and fashions in soft power. Right? Uh, there was a Hong Kong cinema boom in the 80s that faded out. Right? Um, and there was Japanese cultural fever in the 90s that also declined. Right? So it really remains to be seen how long right, and to what extent the Korean wave will sustain. Right? Um, so one interesting example I am uh, following is BTS, right? Uh, that garnered uh, global popularity by sharing its worldview, right? And by building a solid fan base who do not only consume, right? But uh, interpret, right? Uh, reconstruct or extend such worldviews, right? Um, so if the global armies uh, can endure uh, BTS vacuum due to the military service, right, and sustain its royalty even after that, right, uh, there could be an alternative approach, right, uh, or a model for long-term influence. But other than that, right, um, I do think, right, it, it would not sustain very long, right. Um, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, and then, I guess, how do you want scholars to use your work? in thinking about pop culture, K-pop, and placemaking. Mm -hmm. Because um, my book is extremely interdisciplinary. Right? Um, I'm an urban geographer in training. Right? Uh, so I thought about the um, Korean cases, all right, Korean cities, right? uh, like cities and rural places for my dissertation project, right? um, but found there is no um, interesting merits. Right? Uh, that's how I... Uh, I turned to this project right, uh, and engaged in interdisciplinary approaches. Right? So I had to study uh, the theories right, uh, in communication studies, cultural studies, right, um, and about the entertainment media. Right? Uh, and I didn't have any connection to the media industry before. Right? So it was extremely hard to uh, find someone right, um, who I uh, could interview. Right. Uh, but um, such interdisciplinary unique approach, right, uh, looking back, right, actually um, kind of uh, helped me, right, to expand my research scope, right, and uh, research perspectives, right, uh, and it was at the same time um, kind of uh, advantageous, right, uh, in finding your selling points, right, uh, so yes, um, I mean, a lot of scholars, right, uh, ask, right, what really made the Korean wave possible, right? Uh, but rather than that question, right, um, as a geographer, I am uh, turning to more uh, future-oriented uh, questions, like how Korean wave is transforming the country, right? Uh, and the transformation uh, in the place marketing practices, right, could be one right, um, I research it. Uh, Thank you. And I think this is a great segue to my next question, which is about your current work. Um, are you continuing in this line of research in K-pop and placemaking, or have you kind of shifted to a different focus? Uh, I see. Okay, so um, I wrote a spin-off article uh, extending the relationship between entertainment media and plays into the relations between social media uh, and place. Right? Um, I studied Ihua mural village in Seoul right? and discussed about the 
so-called Instagrammable places, right? And it's aftermath, right? Uh, so you can find it in the journal of Media, Culture, and Society. Right? It's online. And I wrote a book chapter about BTS tourism, uh, so-called Bangtan tour. And for that, I myself conducted um, actual Bangtan tour, right? Uh, visiting several BTS associated places, right? Uh, and that chapter will be the final right, work about K-pop, right? Um, and that will be in the, uh, the companion of K-pop edited by Professor Su Young Kim at UCLA, right? Um, and my second pro book project is, uh, is entirely different, right? It's about my hometown, Jeju Island. Right? Um, I am interested in how the modern history of Jeju has been infiltrated with multiple development projects, right? Through which, uh, structural inequality has constituted it and consolidated. Right? Um, so specifically, uh, I will analyze two, two different types of development, right? uh, tourism development in the 80s and 90s and uh, uh, ongoing Jeju free international city development. Right? Um, and I'm interested in how the promise of development right, has actually deprived the island of any benefits, only dispossessing um, its land ecology and communal resources. Right? And mainland or foreign capitals, um, they are the one who actually drain uh, most of the profits out of the island. Right? Um, and I will consider both uh, the material and representational dispossession, right? um, the picturesque representational practices of cultivating exotic and aesthetic images about Jeju. Right? Um, have actually considered the violent process of dispossession, right? uh, making Jeju as an exclusively touristic place, a periphery. Right? Uh, so that's my ongoing book project. Right? Uh, thank you for asking the question, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for your responses. I can't wait to read about um, your latest project. And I think that it might be a good time to shift to other questions. Um, okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, um, everybody, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Um, um, just to remind the audience, uh, you please use the Q&A um, function. It's at the very bottom of your screen um, for to ask questions. That's the only way, unfortunately, uh, we can safely entertain questions without the threat of, you know, Zoom bombers and the like. Um, I'll just get us started just um, while people are, are uh, getting their questions um, or typing them out. Um, I guess uh, one kind of through line, I mean, they're obviously the books are very different topics, um, but one through line for me was kind of uh, that I was thinking about was afterlives um, that in some ways, uh, you know, um, Elizabeth's books is about sort of the after uh, the afterlife of the social movement, right? Um, and then um, uh, Eugene's book is, is, is kind of like the afterlife of this, these, you know, these uh, uh, cultural objects in the way that they circulate in ways that, you know, the, 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 the makers didn't perhaps intend. So my, I guess my question is for uh, Elizabeth, and one of the things in your, your presentation that I found really compelling was, um, and it helped me think about something that I kind of like, you know, never really sort of understood about, um, about these protests. I, I, you know, I stay at the Somerset every summer. So like, it's a very familiar, like I walk by there, like, you know, almost every day and I could actually see the Somerset in the background of some of your images. Um, and I guess the, the thing that you helped me think about is the way in which um, um, the, that this sort of historical, you know, uh, travesty and the social movement that arises out of it slowly becomes a different kind of social movement, right? That it it has a lot of other kinds of coordinates. You talk about it, how it 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 um, amplifies and animates uh, a, a kind of a broader swath of Korean feminism, for example. I just, I guess, I would just want to invite you to talk a little bit more about that. That is, you know, where we're at this moment, as you point out, where a lot of the survivors are, uh, you know, even the older oldest ones are passing away. What is the kind of what does the sort of future entail for you know this, the political energy that comes out of this? Um, what happens to it, and where does it go, and how does it change? I, just can you talk about the the afterlife of it a little bit more? Thank you for that for that question. Um, so yes, the social movement and the protests do have different coordinates and. People are kind of really thinking more expansively about how to address and redress uh, 
gender-based violence, but the core of the movement is still constant because there is not a resolution, right? So they still are mainly focused on calling for official accountability um, from the Japanese government um, have been very clear about what an official apology and reparations and moral responsibility look like. And so when I think about the future of the movement, and, and here I'm, I'm kind of now speaking from a different perspective. Now I'm very much involved in um, a local Chicago organization that's part of the transnational movement and thinking about how we continue to support um, survivors and, and activists ongoing demands for, for redress. I think that the afterlife of the movement here, when I talk about afterlife, I guess, you know, kind of think about the future when there will no longer be survivors, right? And that perhaps those who are college age students will move on and will there then be another crop of high school and college age students that, that come along? I would have to say, and maybe this is the optimist in me, that as long as there is not an official resolution, I think that the protest will continue. And I think that organizations abroad, like the one that I'm part of Chicago, will continue to um, not only call for redress, but also start to think about how do we then practice redress, right? So for example, how do we then think about educating the public about this history? So here in the United States, there are different, different organizations that are thinking about this. Like how do we bring this into a high school curriculum? How do we bring this into the training that different domestic violence organizations do when they're training their volunteers or different um, sexual assault crisis organizations when they're training their volunteers, how can we provide them with curriculum so that they're also talking about this history, the activism, and also the women's example of survivor leadership. Now, along with, I think, talking about that kind of continuation of the movement, also then the question is, and I oftentimes get this question, do you think there ever will be an official resolution? And this is where I'm not as optimistic, um, just because it's, it's, I can see the complications around getting the kind of official apology and reparations that the survivors want. Um, and so I, I, don't, I don't know, you know if, if, if they will get what they, they want. And now, um, at least in Korea, the number of survivors who are officially registered with the government, it's now um, in the teens, the number of survivors. And so there's even a more urgency, right, to kind of think about how can we provide these women with, a, with, with something where they feel like, yes, there is accountability and we do feel like, you know, the, the government that's the perpetrator have atoned for what was happened. I mean, I'm feeling, you know, at the same time wanting to hold on to the hope of what activists and survivors are continuing to do at the same time balancing that with the seeming impossibility of official redress. But I think the middle road is, um, and, and that's what I try to talk about in the book, is that if we open up what we mean by redress, then we see the future, see, right? See. So for example, the question of memorialization is now so central. And, and that is materialized in different memorials that have popped up, not only in Korea, but also here in the United States, the latest, uh, memorial of the peace statue uh, is in Berlin and it was installed on public land and the go Japanese government has called for the removal of the statue and it was going to be removed and then there was a lot of organizing and and on the ground work happening so for now it's staying but that question of you know honoring the women creating the space and then thinking about how we join a larger community of witnessing that is right now our present work and what I think will continue to be our immediate future work. Um, Hegyang, did you have a question as well? Yes, I have a question for Professor O. Oh. Um, thank you for your wonderful presentation. And then uh, I have a question about your, uh, your argument of selling places. Because uh, uh, along with the Korean wave, actually selling place certainly have economic uh, benefit. 
uh, not only for the South Korea, but also the residents in locals as well. But then there's also, I think, downside of this selling place, like in the sense of, in the sense that um, it produces more vulnerable minority in terms of class and gender and uh, spe speci specifically race. For instance, um, for instance, uh, if the place became uh, famous for the tourism, tourist, then the real estate price will, will goes, up, goes up and then there's some kind of a gentrification happens. And then uh, in terms of the class, there should be some people who can, uh, who are deep, uh, how do I say? Um, there's some people who can uh, not keep the place, right? And then uh, also, um, I'm sure you know about the, the film, Korean film, uh, right? It's a it's a it's about Terim Dong, the Chinese Korean immigrants, and their uh, uh, media representation of uh, Chinese Koreans in South Korea. So there's a uh, there's a demonstration and there's a protest toward the kind of a media representation uh, years ago, right? So I like to uh, hear more about how do you think about this uh, this. Uh, gap between the cultural representation and the real happenings in in the in the places. Thank you so much for the question. And I didn't know about the Daeryeondong case. Uh, yeah, thank you for mentioning that as well. I, okay, so. Um, <clears throat> So those, uh, there's a perfect match between civil officials and drama producers, right? Producers, um, they receive amount, right, sponsorship. And civil officials, local politicians, they are happy about the instant publicity. You look, our town is on TV, right? And the instant swelling of tourists, right? But the, there is a problem, right? uh, 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 getting back to um, Joe's uh, after lives matter, right? Uh, there is a problem in terms of sustainability because the um, popularity uh, does not last for long, right? Uh, so even though a, a community uh, enjoys uh, initial swelling of tourists, right? And over time, that numbers, right? Uh, definitely dramatically declines, right? Uh, so it turns out to be a, a one-time event, right? Uh, so how to deal with such fast and fashion is one thing, right? Mm -hmm. And the other one is, okay, so um, some communities became really popular, right? Uh, and turns into a destination, right? And the influx of tourists actually, actually uh, uh, caused gentrification, right? Uh, and there must be uh, some uh, tenants and even homeowners who should be displaced and evicted, right? Because they cannot afford, right? Uh, the ever increasing uh, 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 real estate price, right? Um, so one case is Suam Gol in Cheongju, which is a shanty town, right? A, a home for refugees from the Korean War, right? Uh, and they um, actually drew murals on their alleyways as a means to resist against the redevelopment, right? Uh, oh, but the, yeah, the city, uh, that Suam Gol was featured in multiple dramas um, by Cheongju city. And, but those residents, they were extremely embarrassed because uh, they are uh, uh, shanty towns, right? Are exposed to the public, right? Mm -hmm. And after that, yes, uh, millions of tourists flowed in, right? And so the, not only the town, but also the uh, lives of residents became the subject of visual consumption for tourists, mm -hmm. right? Entire mm -hmm. village museumized, but ironically, uh, only uh, the, 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 a few of the beneficiary turned out to be uh, right, kind of rich people, right? Those cafe owners, right? Bakery owners, right? And most of the residents are actually excluded uh, in terms mm. of uh, yeah, enjoying such benefits, right? Um, so that's another problem, right? Um, yes, and because um, uh, kind of a negative description uh, in TVs, right? Most of the case, uh, those towns remained uh, synonym, like uh, what's the trauma? Uh, I didn't watch it, but somebody mentioned it, uh, mm -hmm. the, 
canola, right? It's about the serial murder case, right? And there is a risk, right, uh, in correlating uh, death story into one place, right? So yeah, pseudonym is used, right? Uh, but um, those uh, film from those case, right? Uh, yeah, there must be, right? So the the negative impacts about the negative description of a certain place, right, are borne by uh, those uh, migrant workers, right. Um, mm. And in my book, I discussed a bit about, right, uh, Myeongdong, right, is a place where uh, a, a foreign tourists flock, mm. flocked in, right. And Myeongdong is called as a global place, mm. right, associated with the desirable and cosmopolitan images, right, uh, that foreign rich tourists carry, right? But those migrant workers, right? Immigrant workers, uh, uh, cottage or like ghettos, right? They are never labeled as global place, right? They are just multicultural places in Korea, right? Associated with the negative connotation of multiculturalism, right? Uh, that actually had a very violent dichotomy between Korean and uh, um, immigrant workers, right? Um, so it's another yes, problem. Okay, and thank you so much for the question. Thank you. And I think we have time for one last question. So, uh, Jenna, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I guess it's for both presenters. Mm -hmm. If you could speak a little bit about how you came to study the topic and kind of your own positionality um, as a researcher studying these different topics. So maybe let's go start with Elizabeth and then to you, John. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I was in graduate school, um, I have this distinct memory. It was, I believe, the spring of my, my second year. I was taking a, a grad seminar on performance and transnationalism in the public sphere and learning about these protests that have been happening weekly in Buenos Aires by the mothers and grandmothers of the disappeared, um, who had disappeared during the, the quote-unquote dirty war in Argentina. Mm -hmm. And you know, reading about that in, in class and then on my own, I, I read the Korean newspaper in, in English and I read about these protests that were happening in Korea by comfort women survivors and their supporters. And I was just struck by the similarities, uh, ways in which they strategically use, utilize space and certain colors and accoutrements. And so I thought, oh, let me, let me write about this. Um, and I was, I was encouraged um, by my professor that there was something more here. And so I decided to apply for a grant and go to Korea and got a chance to participate in the Wednesday demonstrations to meet the activists and, and the survivors um, and decided that this was a project that I, I wanted to work on. Um, in the beginning of my book, I also talk about how around uh, following that, that trip, um, I was, I had a, I had a very fortuitous week where I was both a interpreter for a comfortable survivor who came to Yale to give her testimony. And I also got to see a production of um, what is, what is uh, a kind of a amalgamation between Euripides, the Trojan women and the story of the Korean comfort women. And so for me during that one week to experience both being an interpreter for a survivor, being in her presence and listening to her testimony and also being in the audience and watching a highly stylized representation of their history got me thinking right about the different ways in which people use embodied practices to grapple with this history but also got me thinking about the stakes of moving between activism and artistic representation and so all of that kind of came together and um yeah let, let me hear. <laughs> uh, in my case, um, my field work ex was extremely mobile. Right? I had to move um, from drama producers to um, individual communities right? and civil officials and experts. Um, and to drama producers and K-pop music uh, producers, I was an entire outsider, right? Uh, entire strange person. So they were very reluctant to share their inside information, right? So I had a very um, difficulties in getting information. And for local residents, I was somebody, right, uh, to which uh, they can kind of vent out their grievances, right? So I had to listen, right, uh, 
their discontents and distress, right? And for civil officials and local politicians, I was kind of a somebody who could publicize their cities and counties, right? So yeah, so my position was really multi uh, for right, at that time, but I tried to um, take advantage of such liminality, right? Uh, to get information, right? Um, that are not always available, right? So try to extract, right? As much as possible, right? Uh, but once again, uh, uh, going back to your first question, right? Um, how uh, I can conduct research not othering the hosting communities, right? Uh, that's the question I think I should grapple with. Uh, for my future project, right? Um, right. Uh, yes. Um, I'm afraid we are out of time. Um, I just want to thank all of the uh, the uh, the presenters, the respondents, and the uh, organizer Hak Young. Um, it was a really uh, interesting hour, and I'm, uh, I, I I only wish that it could be here on well, not here in my house, but here on campus at UCI. Um, and uh, hopefully someday we'll have you uh, have a chance to have you guys uh, on campus um, officially. But but thank you very much. Um, I would just say to the audience really quickly, if you are interested in um, the, in, in our events at uh, CCKS uh, at UCI, please feel free to uh, email me or email uh, the center, and we can get you on um, our mailing list. Uh, but until next time, thank you very much. <laughs>